I mean, it's interesting when I was training in India, we had a baby who was like uh, around two kilos, scrawny looking. And uh, the nurse told me that the baby has continuous frothing of saliva. Uh, as soon as I went there, something struck me and I requested for a feeding tube to pass through the nose and lo and behold, it didn't pass through uh, more than five, six centimeters. So it was clear that uh, this case, uh, this child had possibly sufficient atresia. So we then, uh, we didn't have a replogal tube in India at that stage. And we just went for a feeding tube, uh, x-ray, and then confirmed we had a pediatric surgeon who could come and assess. It happened to be a tracheophysial fistula. So this is one of the most uh, important diagnoses to make because of the implications. If you don't make a timely diagnosis, they may end up aspirating. And uh, obviously the prognosis worsens if you don't treat. And it's typical picture that you have a male baby growth restricted and you have uh, this kind of a finding. So uh, can you share some points about tracheoesophageal fistula or esophageal atresia and what you'd like to share based on your experience and then I'll chip in as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, and it's funny, I think that even though we always assume that these babies are going to be caught prenatally, um, they aren't necessarily. So we'll talk about this like for the rest of today, that, you know, the biggest clue that you've got something going on in the gastrointestinal system is if there's a lot of polyhydramnios prenatally. So as you all know, during pregnancy, the babies are constantly swallowing amniotic fluid and then absorbing it and then peeing it out. If there's lots and lots of amniotic fluid, then you can kind of guess that maybe the baby isn't swallowing it properly. And a big reason for that, a common reason for that is because we may have an obstruction somewhere in the GI tract. Generally, the higher the obstruction is, so the closer it is to the mouth, then the more likely you're going to end up with polyhydramnia. So if a baby has like an anal atresia, you're not necessarily gonna end up with polyhydramnios. If the baby has an esophageal atresia, which obviously like they can't swallow anything with that, then it would be less, uh, it would be more likely for them to have polyhydramnios. But what you also said in this case was that the baby also had a tracheoesophageal fistula. So this wasn't an isolated esophageal atresia. So what was happening here, and normally when these tracheoesophageal fistulas happen, normally they're distal. And we'll talk about that at the end. But the esophageal atresia will end up with having a uh, the uh, blockage at the level of the esophagus. And then the trachea basically will have will have an opening and then there is a little shortcut between the trachea and the bottom part of the esophagus that then goes towards the stomach so because of that fluid can go down the trachea across the fistula and then into the stomach that way and so what can happen is that the fluid isn't nearly as much as you would expect it to be so if you don't have polyhydramnios, then basically this baby is more likely to have also a fistula in, in place. So uh, that might be why this mummy prenatally didn't have polyhydramnios and why it wasn't diagnosed prenatally. And they can be missed very easily prenatally. To be honest, I mean, uh, it's not a surprise that such cases get missed in India because most of them are referred from smaller centers. Yeah, and, uh, and maybe didn't have ultrasounds at all. But generally, even kind of the old fashioned measuring where you measure, you know, the abdominal circumference for pregnant for pregnant ladies, if they're measuring much larger to size, then somebody starts thinking, okay, something else could be going on here. So basically, you can have different variations where you can have an esophageal atresia, the fistula might be distally or it might be proximal. The most common case is exactly the one that you mentioned, which is that you have an esophageal fistula and esophageal atresia and then a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. And the way that we would be able to differentiate this on an x-ray is that if you got an x-ray with a pure esophageal atresia, then you wouldn't see any gas distally. So there wouldn't be any gas in the stomach, there wouldn't be any gas distally. If the baby, but like Dr. Srida said, you would see the esophageal uh, probe, whatever it is, whether it's a gavage tube, it would be stuck somewhere in the, in the throat. 
If it is an esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula, then you would see gas because the gas had gone down, like we said, down the trachea, across the fistula and into the stomach. So you would actually see gas in the stomach in addition to seeing the uh, gavage tube kind of like stuck high up, much lower than, much higher up than where you'd expect it to be. So I don't know if you want me to talk about treatment or anything. No, or we'll, uh, I mean, we'll just discuss a few points related to the immediate management. So for example, we suggest keeping the head end elevated so that the pooling of secretions, I mean, the risk to this baby is from aspiration and the aspiration happens when the baby uh, gets the saliva overflowing. It's baby's own secretions that the baby gets collected in the pouch, which is the proximal end of the esophagus, which you said is atritic. And then it goes through the trachea into the lungs, obviously, because the baby cannot do anything with the secretions. So keeping the head end elevated and uh, regular suctioning uh, to empty the pouch is important. And uh, in this situation, uh, obviously, early surgery is better if the surgeon identifies the problem, uh, I mean, can be fixed immediately. Uh, it's very important that an esophageal atresia with the fistula, we don't give too much gas to distend the stomach because sometimes these babies have associated anal atresia. And remember, you can't put a feeding tube into the stomach to decompress it. So till the gas goes through the rectum, you cannot really empty or decompress. So the more gas you put into the intestine and the abdomen sometimes gets distended, especially if the baby has an ammonia and you need pressure. So it's better to uh, bypass the fistula if possible when you're intubating, especially if the baby has aspirated and has a lung disease. So this is one tip. The other important point is deciding when to choose uh, intermittent suction versus reploagal tube. So reploagal tube is obviously a special type of tube which we use for uh, some suctioning, which is basically connecting to the continuous suction and the tube keeps sucking out. And we pull it out like 0.5 centimeter below where it hits the end of the pouch. So we don't hit it uh, touching the mucosa, we just pull it back 0.5 centimeter. So we have to be careful with where we fix it. And um, this is usually in babies who are more stable and where you cannot uh, operate quickly uh, because there are the types of uh, esophageal atresia where the gap is too wide to be fixed quickly and the type 1 atresias which are uh, going not associated with the fistula as well. So they don't need an immediate repair. The baby needs to grow. You may uh, do a gastrostomy to feed them and then wait for the baby to grow to repair later. So these kind of babies is where typically you need a replogable tube and uh, it's less intensive on the nurses. But the babies, of course, need to be in the intensive care because anytime uh, they have a uh, choking like episode or desaturation, you may need to do intermittent suction. The more acutely unwell babies, you would be sucking them out intermittently or some of these babies are very thick secretions. So these babies also need intermittent suction. The key is to prevent aspiration pneumonia because that complicates the uh, actual process. Uh, do you have any issues getting replogal tubes or uh, I mean, uh, uh, fixing them? Any, any concerns in your team? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of even before we go through the fixing, just remember, and you kind of alluded to this, that these can be uh, part of the Vacteral syndrome. So uh, anytime you have a baby with an esophageal atresia, you do have to do all the other tests to make sure that they don't have vertebral issues, that they don't have uh, anal atresia, cardiac um, TE fistula renal issues. So on all these babies, you should be getting an echo. You should be getting a renal ultrasound, obviously doing a very good physical exam. Make sure that they don't have anal atresia. So even before you're going to surgery, if there is a fistula, it means that basically you've got this one way pathway of air going into the stomach with no escape. So there's no, you know, the esophagus isn't connected. So once that air gets in, it has to go all the way down the intestine before the air gets out. So these babies, you can end up with a perforation of the stomach or of the intestine because the air gets in and there's nowhere to go. So with an esophageal atresia and a TE fistula, these are kind of like more emergent kind of operations. If there isn't a fistula, then yes, it obviously needs to be repaired. You're worried about aspiration, but you have, you know, a little bit more time to get these repaired. And then like you were saying, um, the repair can either be done primar primarily. So if you can take the top part of the esophagus and the bottom part of the esophagus, hopefully if you can kind of squeeze them together, then the surgeon can kind of fix it primarily. And a lot of the time though, the bottom part of the esophagus is way too far away from the stomach. And even however much they kind of try to pull it, it can't be done in a primary repair. So in those cases, they have to 
you know, very often tie off the fistula, ligate the fistula, put a gastrostomy tube in, and then basically just keep the baby with like a gastric, with a, with an esophageal suction, whichever type that you use until the baby's bigger. Very often we kind of do bougies where we like press down, like on the top part of the esophagus, trying to kind of lengthen it out as much as possible before we can try to put those two pieces together. It's really hard to get the home health gastric suction and on to, to set that up. And honestly, I think as a mother, that's something that would really scare me anyway, um, just taking a baby home because they can choke so easily. So sometimes when we can't do the primary anastomosis, these babies are in hospital for a really long time before we can kind of get those together. Mm-hmm. Once it is finally done, yeah, once it is finally done, the babies generally do really well, though. <laughs> And the surgeons are becoming more expert at doing Z techniques and stretching it. So, yeah. I mean, they assess at the time of the initial uh, surgery what they can do, either just a gastrostomy. I mean, these are not the common types. As you mentioned, the one with the tracheoesophageal fistula is a common type, and there usually primary repair is possible. But there are some babies where, uh, again, uh, it, they have to assess and decide. One point about the primary repair is that uh, there is something called the trans trans anastomotic tube, which is inserted by the surgeon during the procedure itself through the bypassing the connected uh, esophageal lens. So this is kind of holding the two ends of the esophagus, which have been stitched together. And it is like a feeding tube, but one of the key things the surgeon will tell you to guard with your life, because if the tube slips out, your anastomosis may break. And obviously, to reinsert uh, through those uh, stitched part is going to be very difficult. So, obviously, this is another important tip if you are managing a post-operative baby where primary repair of the esophageal uh, esophageal atresia has been done, uh, you should be very careful with the transanastomotic tube, especially if the baby is intubated and you have to reintubate such a baby. You still have to keep the feeding tube. Many of us don't like to have the feeding tube when we are intubating such babies. So you shouldn't remove this tube. So if you are a junior resident on the team and be very aware that if the baby has a tracheoesophageal fistula repair or is a fistula atresia repair, be clear that the transanastomotic tube has to be remaining there. Once the baby is healed by 10 to 14 days, the surgeon usually does a diet test to see if the anastomosis is healthy. And uh, they would have started feeding the baby through the tube anyway. So uh, you would start removing it gradually as well. So uh, any more points to add about tracheosophageal fistula? You mentioned Vactrel. We mentioned the screening. Obviously, the family can find it very stressful. It's very important to illustrate to them what is happening. The surgeons are very good with diagrams as well. And uh, they would usually show them the exact picture. There is a little bit of uncertainty in the beginning as to what exactly would happen. And so we have to tell them the or possible options that they would take depending on what they find. So <clears throat> hopefully this is not syndromic and many cases, vectoral associations are just associations. So many times it's not inherited. So they don't need to worry about the further uh, kids in the family. Of course, I mean, we can never say with the poly uh, multifactorial inherited.